Um, thanks, Greg, for the nice introduction, and, and thanks, Lisa, also for um, inviting me to talk today. Um, so today I'm going to tell you um, a, a brief story about our efforts to develop a next-generation malaria vaccine. Um, so I probably don't need to remind you that malaria is a huge problem in the world. Um, in 2019, there were over 200 million cases and 400,000 deaths. Um, it's the sixth uh, leading killer uh, in the developing world. This is a disease that uh, largely occurs in Sub-Saharan Africa and is one of the, the largest killers of children under five uh, in the world. So obviously malaria is a, a huge problem. Um, so um, we don't have good malaria vaccines, although I'll talk about the first vaccine that was approved uh, earlier this year. Um, but traditionally, it's been quite difficult uh, to develop effective vaccines for malaria. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is that um, natural infection with this parasite um, doesn't uh, confer immunity. And what that means is that you can be infected repeatedly uh, with the malaria parasite. Your immune system isn't able to induce the strong enough responses or good enough responses in order to provide protection from subsequent exposures. And one of the reasons for that is that this parasite actually has a very complex um, life cycle with multiple stages um, and different proteins are expressed at different stages of that life cycle. So obviously this is a, a parasite that's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and so there's a mosquito stage of the parasite. Um, when it's uh, injected into humans, um, the sporozoite stage of the parasite will then travel to the liver, establish infection there, um, and then the parasite will differentiate, go into the blood. Um, and when it's in the blood, that's when it causes the symptoms of the disease. Um, and then uh, when a mosquito takes the blood meal, um, the parasite will go back into the mosquito uh, and change into a different form, and that allows this cycle to repeat. And so because of these different stages of infection and the sorts of antigens that it, that it targets, it's been very, very difficult to try to identify appropriate targets um, that will make effective vaccines. And one of the most difficult stages actually to target is this first stage where the uh, mosquito injects sporozoites into a person. Um, in order for a vaccine to prevent that process, to prevent infection, um, you need to induce very, very strong antibody responses. And those antibody responses need to be long lasting. And because of the sort of magnitude and longevity of responses that are really required to get an effective vaccine, that's been a huge barrier um, for um, vaccine strategies in the past. So one of the um, sort of most promising targets um, on the malaria parasite is this protein that's called circumsporozoite protein. Um, it's a protein that coats the outside of that sporozoite form of the parasite. Um, and it's a really important protein in allowing the parasite to infect liver cells, to infect hepatocytes. Um, and there are a number of vaccines that target this protein, CSP, um, that are at various stages of clinical development. And a really huge step um, in the development of malaria vaccines was the approval by the WHO of a vaccine that was called, that's called RTSS. This is a vaccine that's been in development for over 40 years now. Um, and its approval, which was about a month ago, is really, again, a, you know, exciting development um, in, in uh, the development of a new strategy to prevent malaria infection. Um, but one of the problems with RTSS is it's just not really that effective. Um, as I'll show a little bit of data later on, the vaccine has somewhere between 30 and 50% efficacy um, early after immunization. Um, and that efficacy declines to essentially 0% within a few years after vaccination. So it's not a really great vaccine. And again, um, while it will have some value uh, as a way of decreasing the number of malaria infections, it's really not a huge game changer. So I'm gonna just show you a little bit about the structure of this protein called circumsporozoite protein. Um, it's a really unusual protein. And one of the unusual parts about it is it has this, what's called central repeat region, which is a repeat of a four amino acid sequence. And there are over 30 of copies of this uh, four amino acid sequence um, in this central repeat region. And because of this structure, it turns out that when you immunize with this protein, when you're infected with malaria and you see this protein, most of the immune responses target this repeat region. And most of the previous vaccines, including RTSS, actually target this region as well. 
Um, and one of the unfortunate um, features of this repeat region is that in order to get protection against infection, you need very, very high antibody levels um, to provide protection. And again, that's a huge barrier for a vaccine to induce strong enough immune responses that you can get protection by targeting this region. Um, but in the last couple of years, um, people have identified um, another region of this protein that actually seems to be much more vulnerable um, to antibody responses. And that's this region here, which is right at one end of the central repeat region. And several different monoclonal antibodies were, were identified that recognize this region. Um, and these monoclonal antibodies are now in clinical trials um, for their ability to prevent malaria infection. And the first one of those studies was just published um, uh, earlier this fall. Um, a group at the NIH looked at whether these antibodies could prevent infection in uh, patients who were experimentally exposed to malaria. And these antibodies were very, very effective. And so we asked the question, can we make a vaccine that targets this vulnerable region uh, of this malaria protein? And potentially that vaccine could be more effective than other approaches. So that's what we did. And this was work that was done by a former graduate student. Now she's a medical student uh, named Lucy Yelinkova. And what she did was we made a vaccine where we just took a simple peptide sequence from that region that's quite vulnerable. Um, we linked those peptides to a highly immunogenic um, platform technology that we've used to develop a number of vaccines. That platform is called the virus-like particle, and it has this very multivalent structure that can induce very, very strong immune responses. Um, and we made vaccines that targeted uh, the, these, uh, the targets of these monoclonal antibodies. And the next thing we wanted to do was test whether we wanted to test whether these vaccines were effective at preventing malaria infection. And so to do that, we partnered with uh, Fidel Zavala, um, who's at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And Fidel has a, a model system in mice where uh, he's engineered a form of the malaria parasite that normally infects mice, but has been engineered to express the circumsporozoid protein from the human malaria. And it also has a, a reporter gene called luciferase. And so we vaccinated those animals. We then challenged the mice um, with mosquitoes that were infected with this parasite. And then we can look to see how much parasite there is in the livers of the animals. Um, and then also how much parasite makes it into the blood of those animals. And so the two vaccines that we developed are shown here in red and green. And you can see that they dramatically decrease uh, the amount of parasite that's in the liver of those animals. Um, and one of our two vaccines, a vaccine that we call the L9 VLP, um, dramatically decreased the number of animals that had blood stage infection. So we saw that more than half the animals that were vaccinated with this vaccine um, were protected from blood stage infection. And again, that's the stage of infection where you actually get the symptoms of malaria. So essentially these animals are functionally protected from malaria infection. Um, so, so what is the relevance of this animal model? So this mouse model is really the gold standard model um, for testing malaria vaccines. Um, many vaccines have started out in this model and then immediately jumped to clinical trials. So we think that this data is quite encouraging in our ability to protect infection from malaria using our vaccine. Another thing that I mentioned that's quite important um, is the longevity of the immune responses. And I just wanna show you a little bit of the data from this RTSS vaccine that was just approved. This is just looking at antibodies uh, over time. And you can see that over years, the antibody responses to this vaccine decline quite precipitously. Um, and you, if you look at vaccine efficacy um, in this study, you can see that by two years after uh, immunization, vaccine efficacy has gotten close to 0%. Okay, so this antibody, the, the vaccine induces antibody responses that decline quite rapidly. Um, and as a consequence, you see less uh, efficacy against infection. So one of the things that we've looked at, again, in mice, is whether our vaccine can induce very long-lived antibody responses. And so this is one of the studies that we've done where we took animals, we vaccinated them three times, and we followed those animals now for over two years after they're immunized, which is about the lifespan of mice, actually. And you can see that the antibody responses go up, and then once they go up, we see this very flat line where antibody responses stay quite high. 
Um, and this is a feature of other vaccines that we've developed that have used this virus-like particle-based um, technology. That's been shown both in animals, but also in humans, that you get these long-lived responses. So again, we're quite encouraged um, by the fact that we can see these long-lived responses and uh, that can potentially lead to long-lived protection uh, against uh, malaria. So what's next? Um, we're exploring techniques to enhance the immunogenicity and protection of these vaccines by testing a variety of different ways to increase immune responses, although we're already, do, already doing quite good. Um, we're looking at some of the uh, immunological uh, mechanisms for vaccine potency. These are basic science questions that we're interested in. Um, and we're quite interested in partnering with either government or interest industry in order to advance the preclinical and clinical development of these vaccines. Um, so here's some contact information. I'm in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology, and I thank you so much for your attention.